You clap. Fine. <laughs> Done. I was talking about Welcome Apollo, to episode 83 <laughs> of the Carmudgeon Show, which is part of the Haggerty Podcast Network. My name is Jason Camisa. I'm Derek Tam hyphen Scott. And today we're talking about. I'm going to let you do this. Um, Jeopardy a music? Les- a, a lesson on some vintage Ferraris. Kind of. And. Uh, the question generally about preserving cars in the future and what do we do uh, to sort of particularly preserve interest in cars before 1980. In a world dominated by Radwood effect 80s and 90s cars, what will happen to the shit piles from 70s, 60s, 50s and before? Only on this episode of the Carmudian Show. I have nothing further to add than that. I mean, yeah, that was fucking spot on. Cinematic. Right? Done. Uh, yeah. Sell so, cars. So I dropped the Honda Beat off at the body shop this morning. You what did? My... You beat off at the where? <laughs> that. I'm just quoting you. Uh, yeah, no, I drove my Honda Beat to the body shop and dropped it off. Okay. Because as you remember, it had been rear-ended on January, well, December Rammed 31st. from behind. Rammed from behind. And uh, the body shop has it now. So they we're going to try to get the bumper off and put it on the frame machine today. Have they found the remains of the woman who hit and runned you? Uh, I have not heard a single thing from San Francisco Police Department, which is kind of annoying. Uh, That's very disappointing. It, you know, I was surprised by the amount of response or comments about my... Yeah, Reaction. people liked you better because you wanted her dead. <laughs> I, where's the justice? I want her to not be alive anymore, I think is what you said. Yeah. Um, I have not heard anything from the SFPD, but I got a check from Haggerty. I mean, the, the, the insurance claim went in such a way that I took pictures of it with an app and a check showed up. And if the body shop charges me more, then I submit a supplement. I don't know. Is there a supplement to pay for the... Uh contract that you put on her life i have not put a contract on her life how could i do that when i don't know who she is right uh i yeah i kind of don't you know you can I pay know. someone to find out i could i could probably just request a copy of a police report which should have the car's registered owner's information on it mm-hmm. um i just don't i don't know i don't know does it matter yes it's, what am i gonna do with this information egg her house no eggs there's an egg shortage <laughs> you can't be egg. eggs are too expensive these days i saw a meme the other day where someone was like back in my day when i was a child we, toilet paper and eggs were so numerous that we used to throw them at our enemies houses <laughs> yeah, uh, you can't do that i can't afford no that. not what? anymore i can do one egg i can afford that mm, i mean i had no toilet paper on the car. just po- yeah um no and then there'll be the next pandemic tp shortage and i'll be accused of you know wasting natural resources i don't know what i do with the information i don't know I don't know. Administer I, justice. I, I don't know. Dox am, her. Listen, I am not legally allowed to administer justice. There's a justice department for that. Uh, um, I hope that she's fucking you're rotting not legally, in jail. You're not legally allowed to to go super legal speeds on the motorway either. True. And I definitely don't do that, though. Of course. I, yes. I, I, right. I don't, I don't know. I'm on, I'm on the fence. Like, you know, you were right in that in the previous episode where you're like, you know, you're being very calm here. I want justice. Yeah, I want justice too. But I, the thing is, I wanted her to have been arrested for leaving the scene of an accident, charged with leaving the scene of an accident, and spend 30 days in jail and be fined $10,000 or whatever the, whatever the law prescribes. But it's not up to me to administer justice on that as much as I would, look, if I see her in public. You will administer justice. Well, if she steps out in front of my car, I'll, I'll swerve, but I'll make sure to run swerve over her foot. In, swerve into <laughs> her. her. <laughs> I'm not the homicide type, despite the fact that I... No, no. I, I'm, <sighs> I wish um, pain and suffering, but not death. Yeah, no. Look, if it was the Scirocco, <laughs> that whole scene on the side of the road would have gone, gone very differently. It wasn't, mm. I, I can't, look, shit happens. She's just a stupid, entitled, I said the C word the last time and my boss made me bleep it out. She's a stupid, entitled child who needs to understand that you, when you're in the wrong, you just fucking admit it and say, oh, sorry, I hit you. She did it on purpose, though. She, in her world, she was not wrong. In her this world, is like the ultimate form of gaslighting. Yeah, I mean, I still, everyone's asking me to see the video, but the, she, her quote was, I know, but like, um, she was like, I've what seen is the video. Problem? Yeah, I've she, seen the video. So this point, is not Jason hyperbole. This is 100% a, an honest representation of right, what I she said. I walked over and she was like, what is your problem? I'm like, you hit my car. That's my problem. And I wasn't angry. I wasn't screaming. And she's like, ugh. 
And I'm like, yep. Yeah. I said something, and her response was, "Yeah, but you were like going very extremely, extremely slowly. slowly." Yeah. I'm like, no, I was stopped at a red light. She's like, yeah, but when it changed, and I'm like, the cars that were in front of me moved, and I moved along with them. Ugh, what is your deal? All right, give me your license. I don't have a license. Yes. All right, I'm calling down. Whatever you. I've seen it. Um, uh, maddening, maddening. You maddening. could also use the admin the internet to administer justice. I probably should consult with my employer. legal counsel and your employer <laughs> my employer for, i just don't know what what yes, are we gonna do with this yes, information yes. like I she's mean, gonna show up at my house because my address will also be on the police report and like you know her dad will show up with a with a pipe iron like it's just it's not worth it i you know i don't know i don't know <clears throat> if if her name and address are on the police report then they will what am I going to do? Show up to the police department and be like, we I'm going to sit here and talk to the manager until you administer justice. <laughs> it's SFPD. You can literally walk into a Walgreens and steal $900 worth of shit and walk out and say, have a nice day. And they don't even come after you. That's San Francisco true. is very fucked up. Yes. I thought I was a liberal until true. I moved here. Yes. And now I'm like, mm. yep, I know. Anyway, uh, so the beat hopefully we'll be fixed shortly. And back we are road. hopeful. I am hopeful. Um, and, uh, you are working on a Vigny Zali video. Vignale. But how can it be pronounced Vignale when it's, a, when it's not French? GN is in a French thing. Oh, like lasagna. All right, that's a joke. <laughs> I was just being stupid. Oh. So this is a Ferrari. Ferrari. Du 250. 250. 250. Yes. Vignale. 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 Yes. So, uh, yeah, we're working on that. The car is genuinely cool. This is from the early early years of Ferrari. They just put whatever body on the car was available from wherever. They didn't make the bodies for very many of their cars. They weren't doing that at that time. Uh, and so, of course, we always associate Pinin Frina with this work. Uh, and that relationship really became solidified in the, with this car, effectively. They made 22 of these things. And... Four of them were bodied by Vignale, and the rest were bodied by Pininfrina. And that was the first time Pininfrina had kind of like almost standardized a body design for a car that Ferrari made. And prior to that point, uh, it depends what era and what the car was going to be used for. I mean, Ferrari was founded in 1947. They made three cars in 1947. Uh, and then I think it was like 10 cars in 1948. But a lot of the early competition cars had open bodywork by touring, and then Vignale started to really make the bulk of the bodies, which they did from like 1950 to 54. And they made 150 bodies for Ferraris. And not a like, lot. Not a lot, but that was, I mean, Ferrari made 50 cars in 1953 uh, for the first time. It was the first year they made more than 50 cars was 1953. Wow. So, I mean, they were just not making that many cars. So a large proportion of those early Ferraris were bodied by Vignale. And they are kind of crazy looking. Um, I don't know. Did you see photos of the car? Or? Not of this one, but I've seen them before, yeah. Yeah, so Vignale always made their bodies by hand. And uh, they never made the same body design more than about 10, maybe 12 times. And so there's huge variation in what the cars all look like because they each one basically got a different... Like this, the one that we have, they made two of those bodies... And then they made a third one that's the same from like the headlights back. Uh, and so they're all handmade. They all look pretty different from each other. They're all the, the there's a lot of trademarks that Vignale did. Their stuff was always really ornate. It had lots of chrome and like engraving and stuff on it. It was like a st steampunk almost. It's just really highly decorated. It's the opposite of like a competition car, which is like very clean Fair and enough. like so yeah. it's safe to say they were sort of a pagani of their day in yeah, terms of exactly visuals, that right exactly that they are just this really over the top like luxurious flashy mm -hmm. lots and lots of chrome trim which is unusual for a european car during right. that period and it's all like engraved with these ornate things uh so yes anyway we had this thing we were making this video about it and the other thing to note about this so you've driven some vintage ferraris you've driven a 330 mm -hmm. Uh, what other cars, 12-cylinder Ferraris of that era have you driven? I was in a couple of 250 Testarossas. I yeah. never drove them. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure I've driven any other v really early V12 Ferraris. Yeah, basically carbureted 12-cylinder cars. Live axle cars. Yeah, I think only 330. Um, well, those are IRS. But So anyway, the, the yep, it's transaxle. The 330 GTS. 
Okay. And GTC is a transaxle. The two plus two was a live rear end. Okay. So the four seat cars were live rear ends and the, the two seat cars were transaxle. I definitely knew that. <laughs> um, so the thing about, so f- what happened with these cars, man, this is just me shitting, uh, not shitting. I'm, I'm shitting words about vintage Ferraris. Uh, th- th- that motor was designed by um, Colombo mm. and that, motor was used all the way until the end of the 400i 412 Mm -hmm. so into the early 90s uh and that engine was the first ferrari v12 so you know 1947 so long first live and that was the first street car right uh the yeah 166 which was uh yeah 48 49 probably Mm -hmm. uh so that engine lasted for a long time and it was done by colombo and the the large i guess they made they eventually made it up to by five liters in the 400 for 412 and it started as 166 times 12 is... 125. It's so two liters. Wow, two liter V12. Yes, so that wow. engine displaced between two and five liters. Wow. Uh, and when they were running those engines in their F1 cars, they had superchargers on them, but the cars weren't that competitive. And so they had this other guy named Aurelio Lampredi, whom you might know from his work at Fiat. The Lampredi uh, twin cam. Twin cam. It's all the yeah. and all the Fiat's. Yeah, Fiat 124, all the those and all twin the and all the launches. Yeah, Delta Integrale has this engine, the Delta, the S4 and the 037 and the 131 all all have that mm-hmm. engine. So he, after he left Ferrari, he went to Fiat and designed that engine. Anyway, Lampredi designed a bigger engine that they could run naturally aspirated in an effort to be more competitive at Formula 1. And so this is called the Lampredi they call it the long block because it's physically larger and it has removable liners that you can replace to increase displacement uh and so those lampredi engines are like just absolute monsters they were they did make a three liter version but usually they're like 4.1 4.5 and i think up to five liters and those would be the 340 and the 410 and there's another 375 those are the lampredi engines so they had two v12 simultaneously right and this is the this is the part that gets confusing because the 308s v8 was the 365 GTP4 motor, which was Colombo, right? Mm-hmm. So Colombo came first, then Lampredi. And the Lampredis and they, were only made until the late fi- or late 50s or early 60s. 60s right, and they were simultaneously yes, there. Yes, you could and have then, buy a, the same car with either engine effectively, so but it would have a different model name because yeah. it had a different, different engine, and that's where yeah. the model number comes from in a Ferrari. It was uh, the it's the displacement in cubic centimeters of each cylinder. Yes. Right. So 166, 12 cylinder would be 166 cc's times 12, which is 2.3 liters. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, so crazy. All right. Yeah. So you got a 2.3. Yeah. They made a two liter V12, 2.3, 2.5, and then the three liter, which is the 250. Right. So. And uh, the... Lampredi engine didn't last for very long, but it's just an absolutely epic, like, I, I can't explain exactly what it's like to interact with it, but it's very different from a Colombo engine. So the Colombos are really tame. These yes, are not they can insane. be. I mean, in a GTO, it's not tame. Right. So I mean, <laughs> Or a 250 that, LM. 250T at Tessarosa that I got driver drive around, they are, the noise that they make is, mm-hmm. I, I wonder if I could find that video for an insert. <laughs> Tremblant in in Canada, Canada. Uh, it was the owner of the track. Was just gave me a laugh in it. But the the n- noise that came out of intake mechanical exhaust, and you got mm-hmm. chapter one, two, and three as it flew by mm-hmm. with the Doppler effect, was just. Mm-hmm. Yep. So what's in this Vignale? It so normally every two fifty they made dozens of variants of the two fifty, starting with fifties race cars and then ending up with the two fifty Lusso and the two fifty GTO. That was the end of the two fifty. It's in the sixty four ish. Uh, every 250 has a Colombo engine, except for this one, except for the 250 Europa. It's huh. the only three-liter Lampredi engine they made. And, uh, man, is this interesting, or should we talk about something else? I mean, this kind of leads us into something. And there's yes. A, the, the, the topic that we had originally decided we were going to do, but no, this is good stuff. Okay, so the, the Lampredi engine, normally you associate it with the 340, 375, 410s, mm-hmm. uh, which were race cars and street cars, uh, both, but they did make one 3-liter Lampredi engine, and this car has it. So the 22 Europas built have Lampredi 3 liters. It's wow. the only ones. 
uh, and that engine just, they sound completely different. I mean, it's the noise that it makes, it just sounds like this deep chested, like it's really, really epic. To me, it is peak V12. You do realize you're gonna have to have side-by-side inserts there of like a Colombo and a Lampredi. Yeah. So why I think this was interesting is one of the topics we were going to discuss is what's going on with pre seventies cars and we were all pre eighties uh, pre eighties cars the really question this is a um, Q and A question that Q&A. came into us many moons some moons a moon or a two couple, ago a couple moons ago by a guy in España mm-hmm. I don't remember his name but it was a very Spanish sounding name and his last name Alonso was Alonso so mm-hmm. thank you for that question uh, sorry we can't remember your name but we suck and if i do that you're gonna see my text message threads because this is like my laptop this very high high tech display anyway more importantly he has some really good questions what's going to happen to the pre-80s cars you know will anyone be interested in that i just spent a couple days with a bmw m1 which i find very interesting and is barely pre-80s yes and here's the thing about the m1 is that so i did a revelations on it that's coming the backstory of this car is probably the most fucked up it's very convoluted very fucked up like it's shocking that that car made it a it's shocking the car made it into production and b it's shocking that the car ended up racing kind of yeah i mean that's german well it was supposed to run you know like regular competition with group four and group five and then they by the time they got it together they ended up having to create a one make series for the car to race in do you know the rub with that race the one make yeah the one make the support races for formula one right so the the head of the uh, we're getting ahead of ourselves because i talk about this in the in the episode and i want to and it's not live here it's not live yet but the uh the guy who formed do you know who who came up with the idea of forming motorsport game bmw bmw motorsport gmbh he's an is it rosha no he's an american ish peter swiss Swiss american is it peter schutz bob lutz what? Like, get the fuck out. I was like, are you kidding me? Bob Lutz did this? He Is there anything that Lutz didn't touch that was a financial disaster? Because everything he touches is a financial iconic. disaster. Iconic. But made iconic. I shouldn't say that's not fair to him. But, I mean, he's still with us. He's amazing. And didn't he's he, like, shepherded. run GM re- relatively effectively yeah, he for, did the G8. for decades? There's so many cars that are the Solstice. So many epic cars are from Lutz, both at Chrysler and, and a different story. But anyway, he hired Jochen Neusbach, Nasbach, who was a Le Mans driver, and they created M. Um, do you know where the M colors come from? The white, violet, the white, white livery with uh, no, blue, violet, and red. You're going to have to watch that episode. This is the coolest shit I've uncovered during this episode. But anyway, they decided to take motorsport under all um, one umbrella and make this car, and everything fell apart. And why did I bring up Nasbach? Oh, because he, he was, as a real Le Mans racer, he understood what people wanted and what didn't. And no one gives a flying shit about a one make a one make racing series. So the whole idea with Pro Car, which is how they initially took the M1 racing, was all identical cars. But they took the the top five, I think it was, finishers from Friday's practice on the Formula One race and raced them against privateers racing their own M1s. Mm-hmm. So the Formula One drivers, if they did well in practice not qualifying, practice. They got seats in factory-owned M1s and raced privateers. And to make sure that everyone hauled ass, they uh, the prize pots were huge. But also, and they, the winners got M1s at the end of the season, whatever, blah, blah, blah. The, but the bigger issue was that they actually bribed the privateers by giving them, I think it was $50 a lap bonus for every lap they led a Formula One driver. So they, everyone was out for blood. And mm. the first year, Nicky Lauda won. I think it was Lauda that won the season. So pretty cool stuff that a one-make racing series to make it genuinely could be interesting. genuinely interesting. And the reasons why they did all of that are in my episode. But uh, the, th- these cars have, con- especially as race cars, they have really iconic following on Continental Europe because they were driven by the F1 drivers. Mm-hmm. And so there's this collector in Switzerland that I... Um, it's this huge building in rural Switzerland and it's got a car elevator and it. it's full of just these insane cars. And there were, I think there was one street M1 in there and then there were like six 
uh, M1 Pro, Pro cars. cars. The guy cool. just was accumulating one, and one of them had, you know, was Nicky Lauda's oh, car. Cool. Yeah. So it was really a neat place to see <laughs> all those cars in one place and neat car. getting raced. But the crazy so. thing to me is, so you know, history is amazing. You know, this is M's first engine, the only engine they'd ever made at that point, I think, was the six-cylinder, 24-valve twin cam. The M88. M88. Uh, that wound up in the 3.0 CSL. Um, and was it did it run as 24 valve in the CSL? I believe it did. Okay. Um, so, but this car was in production from 80 through 83. I can't remember. I think it was even shorter than that. Something like that, but very, very early eighties. Uh, it is the most quintessentially early to mid seventies car I've ever driven. Early to mid seventies. Have you driven an M1? Yeah. Does that car not feel in every way like a 70s car and having nothing to do with an 80s car? I, You know, so the, because of that car's development, I naturally wanted to compare it to a Countach. Mm-hmm. And against a Countach, it felt very uh, civilized. It's so easy to use compared to a Countach. It, that's unsurprising given that the team that did Countach then went on to do M1, right? M1 was fully engineered by Lamborghini and this was, and it's a space frame in the same way that a Countach is. And they definitely, they feel very different to me. They feel very different, but it's, you can see how it's that same team saying, well, this was a little fucked up. Let's undo some of the fucked upness, right? Let's yeah. put the engine in there. But per- to me, it, it, it is such an easy to interact with usable car. Um, you know, the only other mid engined car of that era Mm, that's not true. The the Dino and 308 are pretty easy to interact with too. Easier. Um, Your that that driving position is seriously offset on M1. I mean, the I steering, never noticed this stuff. Okay, so it's funny. I got in and I had in my notes. I did a story at Automobile Magazine in probably 12 years ago on an M1, and I had in my notes that the steering wheel is basically right of my right tit, and. Even though it's that far over, the clutch pedal is actually even further over than the steering column. So you are genuinely sitting this I way. I did not notice that. The wheel is canted this way. So the column is diagonal towards the center of the car. And then the gauges are also offset diagonal and split to the right. So the whole thing is wonky. I did not notice any of so that. It's so funny. And it's way better than a Countach. And still that fucked up. But I could see how this could be the evolution of like, hey, we need a racing. The crazy thing is that Lamborghini never made race cars, right? Lamborghini only ever made road cars. Yeah. And this, the Mura slash Countach team went on to make this M1. And the M1 was, is one of the, what, five, seven cars in the history of the world that were designed primarily as race cars and then modified for, for production car road use. I mean, what other cars would you? Uh, 300 SL, Gullwing. Lancia Stratos. Stratos, 037. Uh, I mean, any homologated Group B car, you could kind of say that a little bit about, like Delta S4. Delta S4 was another one, but, but like all, all the Ford RS200. Yep, that's on the list. And uh, Porsche LFA. 9. No, that was a street car first. That you know yeah. had had Nurburgring aspirations. Porsche 911 GT1. Yeah. Same way, CLK DTM. CLK GTR. There's a, we're listing a lot of cars. Okay, but that's. <laughs> We're talking. I mean, there but any eighties rally car, or the the short wheelbase Audi Quattro. No, no, that was a street car modified for for racing car use. So the, I mean, the okay, uh, two hundred five T sixteen. That was a street car modified for race car That's, use. And there's no, there's nothing left of the two hundred five in that car. No, not really. They, I mean, they cut the front and back off. <laughs> But they kept the body. They kept the passenger compartment. Right. Well, M1 was a hundred percent race car. But it's the was, same way that a a, a, a a Delta S4 is a Delta in there somewhere. Is it? I don't know. I no. don't think so. And a totally different engine placement, different suspension design, different everything else. Well, the same thing is true. The 205 Turbo 16. They put the engine in the back. Okay. So we should come up with a list. That's another episode of all of the cars that started out as race cars homologated for the street. But there's not a lot of them. I mean, mm. they think there are 250 different cars on sale today. Right of them, how many started out as race car? It would be illegal now. Uh, Mercedes one seven seven. Uh, oh, not that's the Aston Martin. Uh, the Mercedes Hyper one, whatever the Project f- One. Project One. That's one. There's one. Mm. That's it. I mean, but also we consistently discuss the way that today is different from the past. Yeah, but I just think it's interesting that that car started out and was a hundred percent developed by a company never known for its racing cars to be a racing car, and it turns out. The thing is a completely civilized, docile, 
wonderful GT type car on the road. It kind of reminds me of an NSX. I damn you for feeding me to it. I Is said it? that in a video recently. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, I said NSX of the 1970s. Funny, I wrote in my in my uh, in my notes this 1981 BMW M1 is actually a 1977 NSX. Yeah, it's. I said exactly that in some so video funny. recently. I forget what video it was. Maybe it was the M5 video that I said that, or maybe no, not not a car merchant show. No, no, no. Okay, in so one of the that. BTS videos. Ew. Okay. In one of my BTS videos, it is, and oh. it is now publicly on the internet, so it's part of a matter of public record. But I, no, the, it's the, great it's that we came to the same conclusion. Yeah, it's a very easy, civilized car to interact with. I mean, and it's the same characteristics you always get in an M88 slash S38, which is that. It's like an M30 a little bit. It's a pleasant, civilized, relatively refined engine by exotic car standards. And it starts to become really lively and exciting when you're beating on it at the upper rev range. But if you're just tooling around in it, it's pretty refined and easy to interact kind of with. dead down low. I mean, it's yeah. Kugelfischer injection, so it's not Bosch. And yeah. they're, Bosch got another what, 15 horsepower out of that thing. Um, when they, in the what, M635? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but so the Google fish, like there's nobody home down low and it's yeah. got long gear. So it doesn't really all yeah. feel that fast. And but the, the gearbox feels sort of not pedestrian, but familiar because you get it in a bunch of other cars. Yep. Um, like the Maserati Bora uses the same gearbox. Uh, I assume it's a ZF dogleg five speed. Anyone at yeah. uh, probably Pantera uses it. I'm guessing uh, anyone who yeah. was using a ZF dogleg five speed in the seventies in a mid engine application is probably the same yeah. transmission. Shifter's great in that car. Yeah. Really long, nice. but um, long throws, but yeah, but precise and just yeah. easy to use. Yeah, um, but it's a very friendly, accessible, usable car. Yeah. It's a car that I would have no issue driving every day. Uh, no power steering is a little bit. So this one had fairly light steering. The last one I drove that had six thousand kilometers on it was I actually injured my shoulder in a photo shoot. I have um, no recollection of steering weight in that car. I don't think it was, was noteworthy fine. to me. Yeah, this one was totally fine. Nice car. Intake whale is un. Uh, believable but not much other noise not, not much exhaust noise no no this one has an exhaust this one had an exhaust on it it still was really quiet oh i um, drove one that had a standard exhaust system really road quiet. car even this one was very quiet but in a tunnel at full like you know six and a half that a thousand revs under full load bleh, bleh, every yeah. bit exotic yeah. and even just sitting here idling so i this car idled at like 1200 when it was warm uh, a little bit lower when it was cold it's probably not supposed to do that but it had this mechanical busyness yes. to it that screams. It sounds exotic. expensive. That sounds busy, and I'm up to yeah. There's things lots of burning a lot of lo fuel lots here. of valves moving around, and yeah. What is I? There was a line in our 330 GTC video. I said, even if you can't see it, you can tell it's expensive. Yeah. The, the stuff that's moving inside the engine. Yeah, there's just a lot of it, and it's moving. It's frenetic. Yes. Um, and so that car is one of the, they made 399 road cars. I mean, 426 or whatever it is, total production, not a lot of cars. Um, so that leads us into the question that we got is what happens to pre eighties cars um, as the demographic for those, who, the people who remember those cars ages out of the market. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a question that's near and dear to me, obviously, because I'm a big fan of, of those, <laughs> those cars. I mean, uh, let's see if this statement is true before I say it. <laughs> say it an, and unusual, let's judge you. an unusual level of filtering. Uh, I'd fact, rather you'd be fucked up, say something stupid like I usually do, and then. Well, I think a big part of it for me is is uh, the amount of experience I have with those types of cars. I love those cars because I've experienced them firsthand, and I think a lot of people who like cars that are more contemporary would come to exactly the same conclusion. And so it has to do with experience. Like, have you had a chance to interact with? enough vintage Ferraris to know the difference experientially between a Lampretti and a Colombo car or, you know, a C2 Corvette and how terrifying it is to try and shepherd it around a corner or, you know, whatever car it is. They, uh, all of the things that everyone always is like, oh, it's so raw when I drive an NSX. And I'm like, no, maybe compared a to an F80 M3, it's raw. Right. But, you know, put that person in a Miura and my God, they... they They'll cry. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone who thinks an NSX is raw will... Yeah, I mean, you their put, therapist immediately upon driving a Mira. And this always happens, you know, the farther you go back, like this, this 250 Vignale is a, it's sprung exclusively with semi elliptical leaf springs and it has a lever type shock absorbers instead of telescopic shock absorbers. I mean, it going over terrain in this car is an experience. And you have this epic motor and it, the wheelbase is quite long to make space for the Lampretti block. It's just this huge, overwhelming thing. And the, the mechanical texture of the gear change, it's just 
so overwhelming to a contemporary vehicle operator. And that's still post-war. Then you go pre-war and you're like cable operated brakes, yep. you know, and like no synchro mesh at all. And you're like, oh, well, I've missed the gear change from second to third. So I have to pull over and stop and start over again in first gear because I can't get any gear engaged because I'm an incompetent boob. <laughs> like th that's a very much a part of pre-war cars. Right. Uh, and so there's this charm and all these things that everyone is talking about analog this and blah, blah, blah. When they're talking about Carrera GTs and it's like. No. Go go try uh, whatever, anything you like that is carbureted and doesn't have synchro mesh on all the gears and whatever. But all that to say that, you know, the question was not like, what is it like to experience those cars, but what will happen to them? Uh, and if there's no chance to interact with them, then they'll probably become museum pieces uh, in much the same way that uh, pre-war cars have. Uh, car buying trends are very cyclical. Uh, everybody wants what they wanted when they were younger. And so, you know, for baby boomers, that meant 57 Thunderbirds and uh, Pontiac GTOs and choose your car of the 1950s or 60s. And now those cars are getting um, sort of superseded in the mainstream buying public's mindset in much the same way that you know, when I started doing this 20 years ago, everyone was like, what will happen to pre-war cars? Nobody cares about pre-war cars. Everybody's interested in 275 GTBs and E-types and, you know, choose car that today people are like, nobody cares about that. And so it's exactly the same damn thing that was happening 20 years ago. It's just with a, a different population mm -hmm. of cars. Uh, and so to answer that question about what will happen with those cars, you just have to look to what has happened to pre-war cars. I mean, that's the same thing, but even like more remote and less chance of someone having interacted with those cars firsthand. There are definitely pre-war cars that are collectible and interesting. I mean, same, like my, the dawn of time for me is in the 1920s. Anything before that, I don't know shit about fuck when it comes to those cars. Like, but there are people out there who care about them. A, a 1912 Simplex sold for $4.8 million in, in Scottsdale. Uh, recently mm -hmm. so there is someone who no no i don't know what a simplex is uh but there's someone out there who does at least two people enough to bid it to or more than four million dollars right so you know the the top tier cars that are super desirable will always have that significance there will always be someone out there who gets it there's always someone going to be out there apparently for 1912 simplex there will always be someone out there for you know, choose car of the 1930s that's iconic. Bugatti Grand Prix race car or those beautiful teardrop-looking Tabalagos and Delahays done by Figoni and Falashi or Mercedes SSK and 540K or Alpha 8C. You know, these are the 250 GTOs of the 1930s. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, moving forward, in what are those cars of the 60s and 70s that have that level of iconic importance? Right. M1, for example, Countach, Mira... Okay. Well, it's 80s technically, although it feels 70s. But yeah, you're totally yeah. right. Or Carrera RS or, you know, choose car. That's So what you're basically saying is you, you the field gets whittled down to just a few precious, really outstanding cars from that era. Yeah. They maintain value and the other ones sort of fade into obscurity. Yeah, there are some caveats. There's some asterisks. A lot of it has to do with usability, right? Pre-war cars are hard to use, most mm -hmm. of them. BMW 328 notwithstanding, Jaguar SS100 is another one of those. You know, the, the cars that were the highest performing cars of their era are now still usable uh, on the road. Mm -hmm. And usable on the road is an important part of appeal. That's why monoposto cars, single seat race cars are less valuable. You know, a, a Formula One Ferrari that won a bunch of races from the early 60s is a lot less valuable than a 250 GTO because you can use a 250 GTO on the street on the road, and right. terrify some other human <laughs> and have a shared experience <laughs> together of terror, especially when someone pulls out and you're in a $70 million car. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, um, so th it's funny that you stumbled on usability because that's where I was going to go next. I was going to say there are actually two factors that I think, um, uh, that really influence value of the older cars. And one of them is, of course, this moving window of time frame from 30 years ago, right? Or there's some sort of period of time that moves with time. And the other one is usability because, mm -hmm. and this is where the, 80, the 80s cars to me really start to make a lot more sense. When you're talking about the, the challenges of driving old cars, what you're really talking about is does the car do what I ask it to do? And can I get the car to, 
to just follow instructions. Or do I know how to ask it to do what to do I what want I do. It to do? Right. The once we got fuel injection and electronic ignition and you know keyed starter, obviously then you know Cadillac 1916. But you know what I mean. Like you know we get in, you turn a key, and the car just starts and runs, mm-hmm. and it deals with being cold, and it deals, deals with, with high altitude. Deals with how, right. Exactly. Then all of a sudden, these cars are now usable by anyone. So. You know, I don't need, I don't really know much about Bugatti's racing history, right? Don't need to. I've driven a 1930s Bugatti straight 851C, but it, the lesson in driving this thing with its cable brakes and the shifter that's on the outside of the car with an inverse dog leg upside down for it, it's all nuts and it's all foreign to me. Um, and then it's like all carbureted cars. Watch when you're cracking the throttle open that you don't stall the air on the way in. And there are just all these rules on how to get the car to do what it wants. And when it's cold, this has to happen. And to start it, you get in a 1983 BMW E30. I was E30. going to say Honda Civic and, you know, da 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 you turn the key and, and it runs and it follows your instructions. And because the transmission has synchros on every gear, it just goes into whatever gear you ask it to. And because the clutch is hydraulic, it's self-adjusting and you don't have to think about that. And you just start to get this layer upon layer upon layer of computer controls. This is the dawn of computer controls. Um, that were focused on giving the driver exactly what he asked for versus the later stuff, the modern stuff that is, uh, that is interpreting driver command and executing it in its own way. That's a very different philosophy. We've talked about the, the gas pedal being a torque request pedal and it's up to the powertrain community to figure out how to deliver that torque. That's a very different thing than directly interacting with an engine. Um, but I can directly interact with a 1960s engine or 70s engine, carbureted engine, and I can directly interact with an 80s engine. And one of them is very consistent and always follows my orders and the other one isn't. You get to 80s cars, you also get substantial, you have some crash protection, you have much better braking and uh, suspension performance and power because we have not gotten faster as a society in, in how we drive than 80s cars. And so we have this moving window but I think we're now at a point for the first time in a long time or possibly one of the fewer points in history where the cars from 30 or 40 years ago, other than safety factors and convenience factors, are 100% roadworthy. I mean, mm. my, all of my cars are between 47 and 34 years old. They're all faster than most of the cars on the road. They all outhandle most of the cars on the road. When things go wrong, they take up a lot more space. They need more space to break. If in an accident, it's I'm I'm in trouble. But other than you know the Honda Beat, which is its own thing, and the 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 Lotus, which is fast, all of these cars do zero to sixty in six in the sixes. They all get twenty five to thirty miles per gallon, except the Ferrari, except the Ferrari, which gets eleven, thirteen so far this year. It's doing really well. Uh-huh. Um, you must have been uh, started the year at the top of a hill. Uh, <laughs> Driven exclusively downhill this year. It's all, let me tell you, at my age, it's all downhill. No, but I mean, you know, all the, all the 80 stuff, my God, it, I get in, the car will sit for three weeks. Turn the key. I Maybe if I'm feeling generous, let the fuel pump prime once. And then turn the key. Starts and idles at 1,000 RPM. I move it out of the garage. I swap it out and it just works. Mm-hmm. And that, I think, is is a potential big influence on top of that moving window where we may for the first time ever see those cars will hold value longer because they remain usable mm. until we go to start we start to have restrictions on combustion engines in city centers and that's obviously coming um, even in the good old usa i have said before i think probably on the show that within 10 years i suspect there will start to become limitations on what we're allowed to drive in the city and yeah. Well, governments tend to hide that, right? The London congestion charge was a congestion charge, except if you have an EV or a plug-in hybrid, it's exempt from that. Well, now you're creating an incentive or you know an economic barrier to driving those old cars in. So is that is that banning old cars? No, but it effectively is. And that's what we're seeing. Uh, it doesn't stop someone with a Mira. No, to your point. The blue chip stuff stays the blue chip, but you know, if you drive a 1994 Hyundai XL, you're going to say, fuck it. I'm just going to trade it in for a, an Ionic five and, and a lot of money on top and a lot of money on top. But yeah, but that's my, now my transportation because I'm saving $30 or $40 or $60 a day in in toll charges. Um, it's the same thing happening with the $7,500 federal tax rebate on EVs. Are we banning combustion engines? No, we're creating a massive economic incentive for people to start 
could start, we're at the infancy of electric cars, start considering EVs. Would I have bought a gas-powered Golf over my electric e-Golf? No. <laughs> no, the e-Golf was so much cheaper and is cheaper to operate. Now, that's a, you know, a benefit. Um, but I don't think I would have bought a GTI, despite the fact that, you know, petrol-loving Jason loves revs and manual transmissions. Um, you start to create a market. You create a demand based on those things. And I think that will be the external force that's going to push 80s and 90s cars val values down. Uh, otherwise, I think there's a reason why we're seeing the Radwood effect and you see the bring a trailer effect of all these cars. Well, and that is also very t closely tied to demographics. Uh, it's the things, there's a nostalgia that the people who are the bulk of buyers sure. right now feel for that era and Absolutely. they don't feel that for cars from the... But don't you think that's a little, it's a little bit out of proportion right now? I mean, again, that's that moving window, right? I believe that there is a unification of the people who are into this stuff that has enabled that is enabled by social media and the way that we can connect each other to each other and mm -hmm. find uh, common interests mm -hmm. in a way that didn't exist in the past. Good point. And so I think that it's a reflection of that. Uh, there was huge quantities, of, and there probably still exist, of the good guys shows and of muscle cars from the 60s and 70s, and these guys are still around, totally. I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, but so uh, it just didn't exist in a way where we, where a visible. person could sitting on their couch see it all unfolding mm -hmm. by looking at the tag Radwood mm -hmm. on Instagram when there's a Radwood event going on, for example. So you know what will happen to these cars um, if we don't save them? Then they will fall by the wayside. I mean, pre-war cars. You know, I talked about the ones that are still relevant, but then there's vast quantities of Lanchesters and. 38 dodges and stuff that just nobody gives a shit about you know they're all just gone and that's just more or less it not all but you know it's a thing uh and there will be probably decreasing quantities you know what are the cars that are at risk it's going to be non-enthusiastic cars or mm -hmm. sports cars always have more value and it doesn't matter what that is it's the thing that it's the thing that causes a 10 year old BMW 7 Series or S-Class to be worth the same thing as an M car that right. cost half as much new mm -hmm. is that they all end up being worth 7500 bucks or mm -hmm. whatever the number is, uh, even though one costs twice as much new. It's because enthusiasts are interested in M cars. And the, the, there are enthusiasts who like E38 7 Series, mm -hmm. and that actually is changing the landscape because thing, those things are so damn good. Uh, but like, I don't know, do you see it happening with W220s, S-classes, you know, that, that, or uh, the first Bangle 7 series? I don't know. There's well, listen, or, you know, or something like a Chrysler 300. You're not going to see anyone clamoring over a 300M, for example, that front wheel drive car. You will see people coming, clamoring over a 300C SRT8 or a Magnum SRT8, right? So, you know, the enthusiast version of an otherwise pedestrian car will will always capture the hearts of the people. And so that's the one that is least likely to get forgotten right. because it has some emotional content to it. But then all these sort of regular mainstream cars, you know, Corvairs or... I mean, you still see... Because Corvairs are, I think, different enough. Yes. That you still yeah, that was them. a bad example right. because it's not pedestrian but enough. But commodity... Tra so when I look back at... we, I was just looking with Paolo, our, uh, our sound guy who's editing our last episode. Um, we were... He was. He asked the question. Were in the 1990s, were like they're all a bunch of 20 year old uh, 70s cars on the road, and so the average car on the road now is over 12 years old, um, and that I believe is an all time high. Um, so we are seeing older and older cars because cars are lasting longer and longer, and that's the march of technology has slowed down for the moment. So a 20 year old car or 15 year old car is perfectly drivable to our point. Um, and so I immediately just pull up YouTube video of Los Angeles freeway in 1992. And there's a, just a ton of like, you know, 70s boats together with, mm -hmm. um, with mixed in with all kinds of other stuff. And I have no idea where I was going with this. <laughs> you were saying how Paulo asked if there were a bunch of 20-year-old uh, cars. Yeah, but it was right before that. It was what the, what, <laughs> Jesus Christ. You just took the off ramp. This is, the problem is that we had lunch. We yes, the problem is always lunch. But um, we, not, we need to be awake. Uh, we need to be not passed out from hypoglycemia in order to yeah but but the but the food coma thing is real um you know we what was the what were we talking about initially you guys have the benefit of being able to uh, yeah run it back i don't know we're just stupid and and tired um it was something about corvair corvair um yes yes in that video i saw a chevy cavalier 
This is, you know, on a bunch of, there were a ton, there were a ton of Accords and a ton of Chevy Cavaliers. If you drove down the road in 1989, I think 88 and 87, the best selling car in America for 500,000 units was a Cavalier. And that is far in excess of any sedan sold today, even though the market is bigger. Nobody sells 500,000. SUVs. Even SUVs, 380,000. There's a lot of proliferation of variants. So this car was impossible. The J car was impossibly popular. They were fucking everywhere and they're gone gone that 94 hyundai that's still <laughs> sitting there collecting dust from the from the icons video gone they were everywhere and so the crazy thing to me is when you see that total production of a car is two million three million four million and then 20 years later those are just there are three of them left on the road that's yeah the amazing and this thing. is the thing where it's far easier to find an air-cooled 911 or a, a mercedes sl because these were sort of treasured expensive yeah. cars that were valued and this is why you periodically see these things happening I mean, this happens with certain years of beetles all the volkswagen beetle guys get super into this and they're like it's got to be a 67 blah 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 or whatever or buses i mean everyone was so shocked i remember this happened at pebble beach in 2005 good and company, I think it was a 05, sold a 23 window bus and it made like a hundred grand. And everyone was like, Are you out of your fucking mind? Mm -hmm. Like, this is a, these are sort of $300 newspaper classified cars. Right. Why is this a hundred thousand dollars? And it's exactly this phenomenon that you're describing with the J car, which is that they were ubiquitous and that people formed core memories that defined their experience of life. You know, I, I had a colleague whose mom bought one new and she said, yeah, we took the middle row out and put a playpen in uh, of the VW bus. And I was like raised in the back of this thing in the course of driving around, like no seat belts, yeah. of course. And uh, and so the, that high attrition rate for something that became culturally iconic leads to also them becoming mm -hmm. valuable. And now, you know, a, a, 20, a good 23 window bus is worth more than a Porsche 911 T of the same era. Yeah. Which is crazy. Did you just see Mark II Volkswagen GTI? Yes, I did see that. $87,000. And here's why. Because... Go find another one. Exactly. With 53,000 miles, tornado 50, red. It's tornado late, red. And it had... Uh, two liter 16 and valve. And 16 valve, yeah. Done. Find it, me another one. They're yeah. gone. Yeah. And so many people have core memories from those cars. Can't find another one. You get a well, bunch and of people looking for it. They, the experience stands up. You experience one mm. now and you're like, what a amazing, Joy. like, textureful, like... Mm. Yeah, joyful experience. It's just yeah. I was I was having a big laugh with Anthony about that because we were. Uh, he was like eighty seven thousand dollars for a fucking Volkswagen. I was guessing it was going to be sixty. He well, Car and Driver. So Tony Quiroga, who's the editor in chief of Car and Driver, and a wonderful, wonderful person, and knows his shit, had found that as the as the Car and Driver's Bring a Trailer find of the day, um, and published a thing. And he was like, I don't think it's going to get to forty five and sold for eighty seven. So damn I thought it was going to be sixty. Yeah, well, you were much closer than he was. Um, the reality of that is these old Volkswagens, of which I own two, are getting expensive. And I didn't know. I, I'm going to have to go adjust my policy here, thanks to their, our discussion of replacement value. But I didn't know all these Cabriolets, Mark 1 Cabriolets, are going for mid-20s now. Mid-20s to upper 20s. You know, <laughs> okay, now mine is motor swapped, and but all original paint and never hit. And da-da-da-da, what do I do? Like that's now actually starting to get some value. Why? Well, 10, 12 years ago when I bought that car, they were everywhere and the junkyards were full of parts and now they're not. And people had these conversations, this exact same conversation occurred 10 years ago, 20 or years ago, 30 years right. ago for 71 911s or yeah. which choose 300 SL gull wings. Mm -hmm. I mean, you find old Astrid gull wings for $6,000. It just, it, this always happens. Yeah. Our friend with the the white going, the 300 SL, yeah. that he doesn't wash and just daily drives because he paid nothing for it. Mm -hmm. It yep. doesn't matter that it's worth millions now. Yeah. I mean, and that's the way these cars should be used. And everyone always says, if I had one of those, I would use it the hell out of it. I mean, it's very easy to say that when you're sitting in an armchair. You don't... Yeah, but a, a 300 SL going, you would want to. Yes, That's one I of would. the few cars that... The 300 SL, exactly. Other cars, I, I would not. Yeah. But, you know, people used to say this all the time about like early 9, 912s for example 912s are sometimes eighty thousand dollars and that i don't understand well how much does a 356c cost 100 grand for a coupe for a great coupe yeah, is 100 grand how much does a 911 cost of the an early 911 cost 150 yeah okay so if you combine those two ingredients well they used to be you know thirty thousand dollars when i was i owned like 10 of them and they were all in the sort of 15 to thirty thousand dollar window I, i'm 
Did I ever sell one? I don't think I ever sold one for much more than 30 yeah, but then you have a 911. For, okay, so it may be 50% off or 45% off, but then you're, you're missing the best part of a 911, the motor. Yeah. So I just, that's why, I, personally, I just... Like I think when 356s are $100,000 and 911s are $150,000 and a 912 for $70,000 is not outrageous. Just get a Beetle at that point. I mean, give me a 72 flat windscreen Super Beetle, for fuck's sake. Really? At that point, it's still got the little tail lights. Yeah, like sixteen hundred. If you're gonna be, I, I just, I'm not a flat form person. Yeah, but then you wouldn't get a three fifty six either. Uh, it's slightly different because the three fifty six only came that way. It's not like there was a three fifty six with a six yeah. cylinder. Yeah. You know, same yeah. thing with a nine fourteen. You know, okay, nine fourteen is. Eh, I don't want one anyway. But a nine fourteen six, mm, then then take a magic motor. At the end of the day. A car is nothing but a, a carrying case for an engine, as far as you I'm sound concerned. like Enzo Ferrari. Well, he was not wrong. Yeah, I mean, you know, I keep thinking I need to sell the Lotus and really start looking for a Series Two at least with a K twenty swap in it. I one hundred percent support that. Oh God, it's my it's the only one car that I own uh, where the motor doesn't inspire. Just yeah, the rest of the car is just epic, and that Toyota motor is a very powerful means to an end. Yes. But it's yeah. charmless. And I just can't stop dreaming about that K20A swapped Series 1 Elise. Well, then you must do that. <laughs> I have to have one. Well, yes. ah, fuck, I don't need another motor swap car. But yeah, but that's, anyway, that's neither here nor there. But to answer that question, it's a brilliant question. Because what we're seeing, everyone's like, this is unprecedented. The, I think unprecedented is going to be the word of the early 2020s. It's not unprecedented. We've seen every all of this happen before, but I think the only modifiers are, to your point, social media, and the fact that we are now becoming, now the cars that are in our nostalgia are really, truly, genuinely capable of being driven every day. They're reliable. Mm -hmm. They're safe enough. They're usable enough. They do everything well enough that maybe that'll hold their value, but you're going to see blue chip stuff, the best of the best. That's a good experience, and nostalgia in great condition rise up and the rest of the stuff like cavaliers and accords no matter how good they were will just fade away yeah and that's part of the joy of going to radwood is seeing the stuff that used to be ubiquitous that has just There's disappeared in large part better than that, that show because for me i'm obviously look you know i'm a child of the 80s you're a child of the 90s effectively and i somebody has the world's most perfect Pontiac 6000 STE. Like I haven't seen one in 25 years. And if I did, I didn't notice it because it was covered in poor, <laughs> whatever it was. And now you have well, somebody has preserved this or like the world's most perfect Buick Riata or whatever it is. It's something that's just gone that I haven't seen in a long time. That Yeah, but in 20 years when there's nobody left who firsthand has recalls the 1980s, then all those cars, those cars are just away. going to disappear and you know some person in 20 years will be asking the same thing about cars of the 80s you know those useless old clap traps what's going to happen to yeah. them you know this so this is very much cyclical yeah but a lot of i mean it, so the value is driven by firsthand experience and interaction with and that's why those of us who do like cars that are disproportionate for our own ages who are into them, it's because we had some experience that allowed us to form core memories around those cars. Yeah. Uh, and so if you are interested in preserving that for anyone, just make sure as many people see and experience the car as possible, whatever the car is, including, you know, cars from before 1980. Right. Because when you start to hear the stories and you start to understand the significance of these things is when they start to scream. I, I think, I don't know if I mentioned this before on the show, but I was at a, it's probably almost 10 years ago right now. Uh, I, I was working for a car magazine and at the beginning of every Monterey car, uh, car week, um, Haggerty had a cocktail party and it was media and friends and, and whatnot. And Mikhail Haggerty, the owner of this company, got up and gave a speech and he was talking about, you know, Haggerty's, I'm going to fuck this up and I'm an employee now, so I shouldn't fuck it up. But the mission- You're quoting something from- Many moons ago. To yeah, be but it's still the it's still the company's mission. So the, the company's mission is to save driving, um, and but there, there's a mission statement and there's a whatever statement. I'm not good at this marketing. And I, but McKeel got up and was talking about the speech, and I'm like, my immediate reaction is this man is out of his fucking mind. Really, you're going to save driving? Within five minutes, convinced me not only was he not out of his mind, but he was 100 percent right, and the man's a genius because his point was there takes a certain size movement in 
in throughout society to encourage governments to uh, to in in a certain direction. Sure, and, this is where year of manufacture license plates come from, right. or show and display, or you know whatever. You have to have a critical mass, and his calculations were when you have 200 uh, when you have 2 million people i think was the number you have a movement then it becomes a real political movement and you can do things about it and so haggerty's goal was to if everyone's wondering why haggerty has bought up all the car shows and auctions and all of this stuff it's because the company's goal is to be that one central repository for everyone who loves cars, who shares the goal of continuing to be able to drive those cars. And if we have that many people all critical behind mass. one cause, we have critical mass to affect change. And so Haggerty was the first company to ever get, Haggerty got the first car ever admitted into the National Historic Register, for example. And I thought, well, what the fuck is that? That's so stupid. No, that's really smart. Because now you can't, t you can start to lay the foundation yes, to not There's a precedent to show that this thing is regarded and acknowledged by the government value. to be historic. Yeah, which, which starts to lay the path to say, hold on. We know there's a better way to, for transport, right? We're going to have self-driving EVs and right. whatever. This is blah, a blah, cultural blah. artifact. It is not a exactly. transportation device. In the same way that you buy a 19 uh, or 1700s house in a historic district somewhere and somebody says, stop, you can put two dual pane windows in there, but please make it look like it used to. Because, so we'd like to preserve this because it's important to our heritage. And just in the course of that speech, I thought, wow, what a crazy fucking idea. And it's really going to happen. And so that is exactly the point that you've inadvertently just made, which is if you take these cars out and show people and explain to people, you know, I take the Cosworth out. People are like, oh, it's an old Mercedes. No, no, no. That, see the bucket seats in the back? Oh, and it's plaid. Yeah, plaid bucket Ricars in the back seat. This was a race car. What do you mean? Well, that's a Cosworth engine. And then all of a sudden people start to get excited about it. And the grandson of Arturo Keller, who is the... Wrote, We've talked about him before, rated the number one car collector in the world, now owns a 2.316. He's a young guy. He's very young. But he sort of huge, huge walking encyclopedia of older cars and is wise beyond his years on, in many ways. But now he's got a 2.316 because he loved that story and that car. He would have never known about that car if he hadn't seen or interacted with one, whether that was at, you know, at the at the collection or my car or whatever. So yeah. That's the most important thing is that these people show us these cars and teach us these lessons. And we both happen to be in a position where we can tell those stories, which I think is probably one of the big motivators. Yeah. At least for me, it is. It is. It's difficult, though, because I know that your Vignale video is not going to do as well. And yeah. I don't know. Here's the thing. I know nothing about the Vignale and I want to know about it. Right. I have not driven a Lampredi and a Colombo car back to back and don't have enough experience to know the difference between those two Ferrari V12s. I want to watch that episode and I know that'll do a tenth of views of your audi rs2 episode yeah and that's so tough to i know to stomach i know but that uh for me it's important to just try i guess i don't know it's maybe a romantic notion uh and i did this i mean i did this sometimes i'm surprised yeah. uh i did the 6.3 video i thought the 6.3 video was going to be a complete flop and it did better than at least half of the videos we'd made up to that point so you know something that seems not that interesting apparently there's dark dusty corners mm -hmm. of the internet where people are hanging out that that topic is potentially interesting but i don't think vintage ferraris i, listen, I have the, that ability the, the, well part of it is you say vintage ferrari and people think you know douche. 308 well they also think <laughs> 308 yeah. or testarossa that's also true but the the other thing is when you get a voice and you have an audience who trusts you and say, you know the idea is if if derek is covering this this is something that really does have a good story or if jason's covering this, this is something that has a good story and that's my hope is that we all get to the point where somebody will pull up my M1 video and say, well, I don't really know all that much about it. But if Jason took the time to write a Revelations episode on it, maybe there's a story here that I should know. And that's that's always what I'm trying to do. And balancing the, you know, I knew the Four Torah show was going to be a huge Revelations. I knew the 500D was going to be huge. Um, but I also did an Alpha SZ that I knew was not going to be huge. But that was a really cool story behind that car. And it's a really neat thing. And so I balance those things out in the hopes that if people have watched one or two of the big ones then they'll come back and watch the smaller ones but um such is the the curse of of uh you know people knowing what our view counts are yes that's true social media i mean i i just try to tell a story if i think it's interesting i i make effectively i make something that i would want to watch right uh and then this is a very 
build it and they will come approach, which is not the best. You know, you're supposed to survey the customers and ask them what they want, but yeah, but then they don't know, always know what they, they want. They don't know what they want. And the, you know, that's the idea is that if you've been exposed to something and you have a story that you're excited about, like the Miura, to... for example, or some iconic vision, like car it was not made in response to, you know, asking customers what they wanted. They didn't know, or, you know, or an iPhone. I don't think people understood what an iPhone would do before it came out. And so if you'd surveyed people and said, do you want this thing? And they're like, no, 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 I, don't, I have a phone already. Why do I need it right. to do all these other things? It was, so you, it, this is when things start to become truly visionary where you have to say like, what is the future look like and how can I make something that addresses This is sadly that? what's going on with EVs in the world. I mean, every time I publish anything with an EV on it, you know, a 10th of the comments are really negative. Get that fucking electric thing and get this out here. At the end of the day, this is, we're not yet being able to imagine what a new world looks like in terms of, in, in terms of the, the, the damage that we're doing to the environment. And, you know, the same ar arguments crop up again and again. Oh, but we have to mine it. Yeah, but don't forget we're drilling oil out of the ground. And other people who are far smarter than me and know a lot more have decided that this is the best way. But we can start to imagine a world where cities are quiet and things are autonomous and we don't have car ownership. And, you know, you just hit a button and an Uber shows up, but the Uber doesn't have a driver in it. And trust me, when you live in San Francisco, we have driverless cars and cars with people in them and i much prefer to interact with the cars that have no one in them at this point <laughs> drive around san francisco at 10 o'clock at night and they're cruise you know chevy chevy bolts yeah and i don't ever not trust them they stop at stop signs they're never drunk i mean it's a computer and okay they occasionally you know slam on the brakes and back into people and brake check people and fuck with them i guarantee you their safety record is better than the average san franciscan yeah. um like the bitch who fucking rammed me i'm sorry it'd be very well, look at full circle. Full circle. We're back where we started. Angry. Uh, angry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, great question. Thank you to Mr. Alonso. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that. we did it justice. I hope so. On this, the 83rd, Third. perhaps, episode of the Carmudgeon Show. Part of the Haggerty Podcast Stop Network. It. They know. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>